In the Old Testament, I read this. Proverbs 4. The beginning of wisdom is acquire wisdom. With all your acquiring, get understanding. Prize her, and she will exalt you. She will honor you if you embrace her. That is wisdom personified. She will place on your head a garland of grace. She will present you a crown of beauty. And the New Testament, more of the same. Therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise. There is a call throughout all of Scripture for us to grow in wisdom. Now, there's a difference between wisdom and knowledge. You see, many people can pack their brains with all kinds of facts and knowledge, and they can write elaborate formulas and win every contest of trivial pursuit and spit out the Bible like a scholar. But still, even though you can do all of those things and be the smartest man or woman on the earth, you could still be considered in the eyes of God a fool because you don't have wisdom. Wisdom, again, is not knowledge. What wisdom is, is taking the knowledge that God has given you in his scriptures and knowing how to apply it. That's wisdom. You don't learn wisdom behind a desk. You learn wisdom in the classroom of life, don't you? Right? And the way it works is the Holy Spirit will take the knowledge of the scriptures that you have. That's why you need to know the word of God to be wise. Take the knowledge of scriptures you had and teach you how to apply it. And he will use experiences you go through in life. He will use trials you undergo. He will use the conversations that you have with older wise men and older wise women. And he will teach you the deepest and richest application to God's word to life's daily situations that you deal with. We are commanded. We, 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 for our own safety and our own health and our own joy, we should be growing in wisdom. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm learning that to be a parent, you need a lot of wisdom, right? I'm still trying to figure this thing out. It's not easy. It takes a lot of wisdom to raise a child, and if you don't, you're headed for disaster. Knowing what to say to your kid at times, how to say it, when to say it. I mean, how much freedom do you give a kid? You know it's not all no, 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 but you know it's not all just do what you want to do. Where do, you, where do you strike the balance? How about what movies do they watch? Who do they hang around with? What parties do they go to? What school activities do they participate in? What music do they listen to? How do they dress? What is their involvement on social media? It's not just yes or no. Well, how do you know what to do? It's wisdom. How do you balance a child's fun that they want to have at home, but also the responsibilities they have to contribute to a productive family? It's not one or the other. I got some teenage daughters. Should they date? At what age? What kind of guy should they pursue? What should be my involvement in these matters, right? Right? How do you do a family devotional? We're called to do that as parents, to bring our family to the Word of God. How do you do that in such a way, moms and dads, without boring your kids to death? How do you speak to your kids without lecturing to your children? How do you develop with your kids an intimate personal relationship where they feel comfortable going to you and discussing uh, deep matters on their heart without being their buddy and their peer? What should you forsake in your own personal life to to set a better example for your, your children? How about discipline? What do you discipline for? Why should you discipline? How do you discipline, especially as they start getting older? When should you discipline and when should you overlook an offense? How do you make sure that every ounce of your discipline is always done in love? I mean, I could keep going with this list. It takes tremendous wisdom to be a parent. And when you figure it out for one kid, just wait because the situation changes for the next kid. Just because they come from the same gene pool doesn't mean they're all the same, right? And when you figure out that one kid, he or she morphs into another individual sometimes, and you've got to redo it all over again. It's difficult. It's not one size fits all. You need knowledge. But to answer these questions, you need a tremendous amount of wisdom. So I started off that way because what I see when I study this passage is Paul dealing with a rather foolish church in Corinth. They're really fools. 
kind of deals with that in 1 Corinthians. I mean, he writes 1 Corinthians to them, and he deals with these issues of just folly. They had all kinds of moral problems. They had all kinds of doctrinal error in the church. And he says, you know what, I'm looking forward, as he wraps up 1 Corinthians, I'm looking forward to coming and visiting you guys. And then he finds a way to say that, uh, you know what, I've changed my travel plans. I'm not going to see you once, but I'm going to see you twice. We've been talking about this. But then he realizes that there's some problems going on in that church that I've got to deal with right away. I can't wait till my two promised visits. I need to make an emergency visit to that church. Timothy told me that things aren't going well, and it was an awful visit. Because when he gets there, he finds out that this church that he poured his life into turned his back on him. And they believed all these lies that this anti-Paul sect was saying about him that were not true, lies about his motives and lies about his character. And he goes there and he leaves. He leaves depressed. And he says, you know, those two visits, I promise you guys, I'm not coming back. I'm, I'm going to, as he said last week, I'm going to spare you guys. And he shoots him a letter instead. He says, I'm going to wait on the Holy Spirit. No sense in me coming back to that situation. I'm going to wait on the Holy Spirit to bring about repentance in your life. But here's some things that are on my mind and some things I think you need to do. We call that the severe letter. We don't have it. It was, it was actually 3 Corinthians. It was a harsh letter. I mean, it's one of those that either the church is going to receive it and change or they're not going to receive it and, and, and basically this thing could just be done. So he's really concerned. And he hooks up with Titus. And he finds out from Titus that they got the letter. And that they repented. And things are turning around. And as a matter of fact, the, 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 the bad guy, that the anti-Paul guy that was leading, kind of the queen bee that was leading this whole anti-Paul sect, you know, the, 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 the big head honcho guy, the big kahuna, this guy, they discipline this guy. And then he finds out, not only do they discipline him, they shut him down, but then this guy repents as well. And you're thinking, this is good news. Everything turned around, right? Well, not really. It never works that way in a church. Because this church was, they were fools. They were just fools. It was just foolish, darkened, one-directional thinking. It was one extreme or the other. I mean, one minute they're so gullible... They fall for this guy's lies. Then they realize how wrong it is. They finally discipline him. They do the right thing. And then they commit another wrong, which we're going to see today, by failing to forgive the guy the moment he repents. So one minute they're turning on Paul. And then this guy gets disciplined. He repents. And then they turn on him. And Paul says, i got to talk about that in 2 Corinthians now. We're going to see this morning the wisdom we need. It takes wisdom. Uh, to exercise both severity and forgiveness. We've got to do both, and sometimes we've got to do both at the same time. How do you do that? How do you come down hard on someone when we're also called biblically to forgive people? And how do you make sure you do severity and you do forgiveness both in love? Because when you don't do these things and you don't do them in love, what we're going to see is we open up the door wide open for Satan to have a field day with us. So let's begin with this passage. The church needs wisdom to know how to respond. They got an awful situation in their midst. What's the foundation of wisdom? It's a good theology. What's the foundation of a good theology? It's always grounded in the Word of God. I mean, Paul, no doubt, was hurt in the way he was treated. But what I see him doing in this section is he's not getting all bent out of shape in the way he was personally affected. You see, the reason he wants the church to come down in this guy, something he probably said in that severe letter that we don't have, is because it wasn't about him. It was because of his love for the church. It wasn't to just like mend, you know, discipline him to mend my broken heart. It wasn't, you know, you know, how can you do this to me? You need to stand by my side, discipline him. It wasn't, you know, based upon the way he hurt me, punish him and seek revenge. That wasn't the case at all. He told the church that uh, when things aren't going well, it affects their relationship with him. And when things aren't going well with him, it affects their relationship with Christ. Because he was an apostle of Jesus Christ. It wasn't about Paul personally. You see, he was able to get himself out of the way. It was about him being a mouthpiece of the word of God. And when they shut him down, they shut down the word of God. And when you shut down the word of God, you shut down Jesus Christ. So Paul says, shut that guy down because he's basically killing the church. 
But then the guy repents, and we're going to talk more about that. He, he gets disciplined, and he repents, and where do you see Paul in this section? He's right there on the front lines. He's leading the charge. He's not bearing a grudge. He's saying, guys, forgive him now, would you? You see, this is just wisdom and how he deals with this. It's able to you know, kind of get yourself out of the way, see what's best for the church, to see every situation we deal with, not through our own biased perspective, not through what the world says is best, not what the flesh dictates we do, but rather through the, the eyes of God. Good theology grounded upon the Scriptures. Look at verse 5. Let's dig into this. But Paul says, But if any has it caused any sorrow, he's not, he has caused sorrow not to me, but in some degree, in order not to say too much, to all of you. Paul says, Let me make this clear. I was hurt. He says I was hurt to some degree, but don't make this about myself. You see, when people get hurt in the church, and it's a reality that will happen, if it hasn't happened to you yet, it's going to happen to you sometime. This is not heaven. You will be hurt by somebody in the church. I promise you that. And what I see people do is they respond in such horrible ways. It's either this massive pity party, woe is me, which takes the ministry of the church off of Jesus and onto you now, Or it's this retaliatory spirit that says, I'm going to get the church back for what they did to me. We don't see that here. Paul says, yes, I was hurt. In many ways, I think he was hurt more than anybody else was. But he says, it's not about me. Really, who should have been hurt the most is you. Okay, Paul says, to some degree, I experienced some sorrow. But the grief was mainly upon you guys because your church is sitting on the precipice of extinction. So don't worry about my feelings. You guys should be sorry for what that took place in your church because you guys are about to go out of existence. That should have brought you greatest sorrow. But see, these guys don't know how to, they don't, they're extremists. They're fools. So you got these guys in there. They're doing absolutely nothing to preserve the church unity. You got these false teachers ripping Paul apart, trying to burn the church down, right? And they sit back and they do nothing. They let this mutiny happen right there in their midst. And when they act, what do they do? They go to the next extreme. They act and discipline the guy with no love at all. No forgiveness extended to this man once he repented. The guy comes around, and all they want to do is just keep punishing him. Look at verse 6. Sufficient for such a one is the punishment which was inflicted by the majority. You know what the translation of that is? Enough already. Enough already. All right. Let me take a breath here. Um, you're probably thinking, okay, hold, there's at least two people in here saying, um, whoa, 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 hold on a second. Oh, you're going too fast. You lost me on that whole church discipline thing. What are, we, what are you getting at with that? What is church discipline? So I'm, I'm glad you asked me that question because I want to draw some conclusions from that and make sure we're all on the same page regarding church discipline right from this passage in the Word of God, okay? Let's draw a couple conclusions, then we'll get right back back in our text. First of all, what I'm getting out of this is, number one, the Lord expects us to practice church discipline when it's necessary, number one. You say, when's it necessary? Anytime someone sins? Well, if that's the case, we'd all be under church discipline, right? Of course not. Church discipline is used as an extreme measure when there's an individual in the church that after repeated warnings refuses to repent, and his or her sin is causing tremendous damage in his or her life and in the life and reputation of the church. you got to deal with it. You say, that's that's weird. The church is going to call someone out in their sin? Isn't that kind of like judging someone? That's bad, isn't it? Well, you're thinking like the world. You're not thinking like Jesus. Because Jesus brought us this principle, right? Matthew 18, when your brother sins, go and show him his fault in private. Someone sins against you, you don't broadcast it to the world or in front of the church. You go one-on-one. You don't gossip about it. You get the log out of your own eye, right? And you try to remove the speck in your brother's eye, and you bring to the Word of God and say, here's what happened, let's talk about it, let's fix this thing. Concerned with what you're doing, whatever the case might be. But if he doesn't listen to you, you take two or more witnesses with you. That's step two, right? that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact may be confirmed. If he refuses to listen to them, what's step three? I'm just going to read the words of Jesus. 
He says, you tell it to the church. Who's the church? It's you. He says, then if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and tax collector. Well, we see it in 2 Corinthians here. We see it in Matthew 18 there. We see it in 1 Thessalonians 3. We see it in 1 Corinthians 5. It's all over Scripture. You say, have you ever had a church discipline situation here at this church? Well, 13 years, we've had three. We've had three. And uh, I could be the first one to tell you they are the, the most awful, painful, gut-wrenching things that I have to go through for, for several reasons. Why do you do it? Because we're commanded to. Because we love people. That's why we do it. We love people. But it's painful. So don't sin, okay? Because I don't want to go through any more of these things. <laughs> you guys behave yourselves. Second thing I see here, it's going right from Scripture. Paul refers to the, look in your, in, your, in your verse there, the punishment that was inflicted by the majority. Okay? So it wasn't just a leadership thing. It wasn't like, you leaders, you guys deal with that church discipline stuff. We'll just kind of worry about our own issues. No. It was the church that disciplined him. It was a congregation thing. You say, what was the congregation doing? They do what church disciplined people do. You, you, you are lovingly trying to restore the person. It's not punishment. You don't discipline your kids out of punishment. You discipline them to correct them. Not to get them back for the way they hurt you as a parent. That's sin on our part if we do that. We discipline them to correct them to make sure that they don't do that same mistake again, which is going to cause them problems. Same thing with church discipline. We as a church are not trying to punish anybody. You embarrassed us. You made life difficult for us. You treated your wife horrible, so we're going we're to come after you now. That's sin. But it's saying that you're in a position of danger. And we just love you so much that we're not going to let you suffer like this. We care about you. And we want to call you back to a place of safety. All right? That goes to number three. Church discipline is not punitive. We're not executing revenge. We're not paying someone back for the wrong they committed. The goal, as I said, is restoration. You say, who are you restoring people to? You're restoring them back to the Lord, right? These people have walked far away from Christ. It's not something you just pull the trigger on right away. People have warned them. Individuals, individual groups of the church, it's warning after warning after warning, and they're just walking completely away from Christ. And what you're trying to do is get them back in fellowship with the Lord. Boy, oh boy, if I'm walking away from Christ, I hope you guys love me enough to do something about it. And in many cases, they've also walked away from their church and they've walked away from their family. And we're in the business of restoration. We're fixing families, fixing church relationships, fixing relationships with Christ. And number four, when church discipline is effective and the individual repents, it's the responsibility of the church to forgive, to restore the fellowship, to drop the matter completely and just move on from this situation. And that's what this church did not do. That's the problem. They execute the discipline. Good, we give you a gold star for that, Corinthian church. The guy repents. Praise God for the Holy Spirit bringing about repentance in his life. And then they're just heaping a world of hurt still on this guy. That's unloving. They took something good and they made it bad. Paul says in verse 7, So on the contrary, you should rather forgive and comfort him. Otherwise, such a one might be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. Stop it already. He repented. It worked. Forgive him. Comfort him. Don't let the guy be grieved with excessive sorrow. I mean, this is, this is so true, folks, of what's going on in today's church. That Paul just gives them his heart. The guy's above reproach. He's a great apostle. He's a great pastor. He gives them his life. He gives them his time. He suffers for them. He sacrifices for them. He loves them. He cares about them. And these people tell lies behind his back, and the church believes them. And they turn on the Apostle Paul. And they question his character, and they question his motives. You know, scholars have tried to take the, the verses that you see in First and Second Corinthians, and they've tried to kind of reconstruct the details. And the best thing that they come up with is that Paul went there on that, that painful visit we talked about, remember? And um, he almost kind of, in, I envision like a church meeting. He's like, Corinthian church, Paul's in town, let's have a meeting. So everybody gets together, they all come, right? Put the video games away for the night, come. 
And they're all sitting in the chairs and their pews. And Paul stands up and he starts talking. And a guy, basically, the, the belief has accused Paul right to his face. So someone stands up and just starts blasting Paul publicly, accusing, lie, 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 lie. And Paul's sitting there and he's like, what do I say to this? And no one in the church defended him. The belief is they all sat by idly and they did absolutely nothing. Nobody responded. And what I find again so interesting about that is, remember in 1 Corinthians, and there's two sections in 1 Corinthians, because it's a big deal, and Paul, Paul, Paul talked about those factions in the church. Remember that? I'm for Peter, right? I'm for Apollos. And what was the third faction? I'm for Paul. And I have to wonder when this was going on, where were those guys? Where, where were those? They, were, they said nothing. Paul's getting ripped apart, and these guys are saying nothing. But then... Discipline happens, then the guy repents, and all of a sudden, now it's expedient. Now it's the culture of the the church, like, we're going to stand up for Paul, and these guys come out of their shells, and they're kicking this guy when he's down. We're we're with you, Paul. It's Paul, the one that I think was hurt the most by this whole thing, saying, knock it off. Don't hold out unforgiveness for my sake. See, he's he's, he's a man. Don't, don't punish this guy for me. The discipline worked. It accomplished its purpose. Look, like verse 10, he gets at it. If I can forgive him, you can forgive him as well. Verse 7, forgive him. Verse 7, comfort him. Verse 8, reaffirm your love for him. Verse 7, don't let him be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. Stop it already. Enough is enough. This is not the way we do business in a church, guys. You know, it's interesting that today's church has a problem doing church discipline when there's an unrepentant individual, right? The church back then did the church discipline and didn't know when to stop the discipline when they had a repentant individual. You see, air on both sides. You know, I told you we had three church disciplines. And um, I'm holding out hope for the third, but the individuals of the first two, they were both men, they they both repented. So it worked. It worked. Um, But what happens is when you church discipline someone, um, it almost always happens this way, they leave the church right away. Now, let me be clear. Of our three situations, we've never asked anyone to leave the church. We've asked people to leave the church. Never any of those three individuals. We never said you must leave the church. We want those people to sit under the Word of God. We want to see that. We want to be here when they repent. And what they do is they leave the church. And what they do then is they go to another church in the area, right? It's the same in all three, I think. And what does the other church do? Oh, how can they treat you so bad at Grace Tabernacle? We won't judge you here. You know, come. This is a place of refuge for you. And what, that ha- what it does is it just, it like, it like, it short circuits the whole process. You understand? I mean, we do the heavy lifting. We do what God calls us to do. I hope we do it in, in love from beginning to end. And then these other churches just mess with it. They undo it, in a sense. And I had a man that called me, a uh, pastor not far from here, um, when one individual went to his church. And he called me and said, hey, I want to let you know, Randy, the good news, that the individual that you guys church discipline um, repented. And I said, that's, that's great news. Praise God. That's, that's all we want. All we want is restoration. We just want, it, we want restoration. You know, in that situation, I, I'm not going to go into details, but it was, it was bad. What he was doing was really bad. And I said, you know what? All we want is restoration. And uh, I said, could you send that guy back to us? He goes, oh, he doesn't want to come back. I said, um, I said, he needs to come back. According to 2 Corinthians 2, I cited this passage right here. We need to have him back. We want to publicly forgive this guy. We want to publicly bring him back into fellowship. We want to publicly wrap our arms around this guy because the system worked. We want to restore him to the place he once enjoyed. We are not to be a church, folks, that just sweeps issues under the proverbial carpet of we don't judge. That's a nice one-size-fits-all mentality in people's minds. It doesn't work here. We're, we're called to be a holy place. We're called to be a light to the community. 
And we're called to help families. I mean, what do I do when I have a guy that came to me and he, he said a couple years back, he goes, uh, he goes, I go to a church. He told me what church he goes to. And he said, uh, Pastor, I need some help. I need some counsel from you. I said, what is that? He said, my wife has left me. He said, um, I've you know, done nothing biblical that would, would necessitate a divorce in any way on her part. And um, I, I want my family back and my family's in shambles. I said, tell it to your pastor. He said, I, I did. We're members of that church. And I told the pastor, and he's aware of everything that took place. And I asked him, I said, well, what are you going to do to help my family and help save my marriage and help my kids? And the pastor said, we're, gonna, we're not going to do anything. Is that loving? I've had, I've had women come to me in tears. My husband's going to leave me. What do I do? Uh, we don't judge around here. Is that, is that right? Is that the example we want to set for other guys, that you can just leave your wife and we don't, we don't get involved in these things? Is that, is that right? Is that loving? It takes wisdom. It takes courage to confront sin. We, we are called to confront sin lovingly and gently and kindly. It takes courage to forgive those who sin as well and striking that balance between this forgiveness and conf- confrontation. I mean, it, it calls for incredible wisdom. I had a friend I was talking to a couple years ago, the pastor out of state, and he told me about a man that they needed to discipline at their church. And I said, I'm curious, what would you, you have to discipline him for? And he said, the guy, younger man, had a family. Uh, he just stopped working. He just didn't stop working. I mean, First Thessalonians 3 makes that clear. You don't work, you don't eat. Um, and that happens automatically if you haven't figured it out. You don't get the money, you don't <laughs> get the food. And the, the family was going unfed. The needs of the family were not met. It was embarrassing to the church. People in the community knew about this. I mean, and he goes, we waited as long as we could, but we finally had to discipline him. I said, what happened then? He goes, he left the church. I said, that always happens, almost. And he goes, he goes, he went to all the, he started playing the circuit. He went to every church and started telling every church how unloving, right? Oh, they're so unloving because it's always his side of the story. They're so unloving to me. I said, how'd you find out he did that? He goes, because we got a family from his little comments. I said, what do you mean you got a family from his comments? He goes, oh, yeah. He went to one church, and he was just gossiping about how unloving our church is, and he was talking about the church discipline situation, and a man said to him, what church is that? And the guy said, oh, it's this this so-and-so church. And the guy says, that's the church I want to be at. And the guy left his church and came to my buddy's church. And the guy now is the head of the counseling ministry. He's on staff at my friend's church. Why is that? Because people say, we want to do what Scripture says. People say, I need accountability, folks. That's not the only reason, but that's part of the reason why you fill out the friendship cards. It's called accountability. It's a good thing, not a bad thing. I need it. I desperately need accountability in my life, too. So let's take that example. Young man... Repeated admonitions and warnings doesn't work. What does the church do? He's not caring for his family. Wife's calling me, crying. Kids are having trouble putting clothes on their backs. It's not money to put gas in the tank to go anywhere. What, 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 do I, what do I do? Other guys see that. It sets a bad example for them. It's destroying the reputation of the church. Other people in the community find out, oh, they go to Grace Tabernacle. <laughs> That's not the place I want to go if he goes there. What do I do? Do you forgive or do you discipline? Answer, you do both. Well, which one's more loving, forgiving or disciplining? The answer is both are loving. It's like the crazy, foolish parent that says, oh, pastor, I just don't know when I need to discipline my kid and when I need to love my kid. That's not the balance you need to work with. Discipline is love. It's foolish to say discipline isn't loving. It's clearly foolish to say that because that church practices discipline, that they don't practice forgiveness. That's silly. Good churches, as you see in Scripture, practice church discipline, and good churches better, as you see in Scripture, better, better, better practice, which this church in Corinth didn't do, church forgiveness. We better be forgiving people. So marks us as Christians, not just as a church, but in our own personal lives. I hope there's no one right now that you are holding a grudge against. Even when we church discipline someone, I am still continually forgiving that individual. I'm not bearing a grudge against them. 
I see them, I hug them, I talk to them. There's no grudge. There's no personal animosity toward them for the hurt and pain they brought into my life. No. Ephesians 4.32, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other just as God in Christ has forgiven you. How important is it? Well, if you're an unforgiving soul, there's a good chance you might be an unredeemed soul. You probably don't know Jesus. Because if you know Jesus, you've experienced forgiveness. How can you not extend forgiveness to others? Jesus himself said, if you forgive others for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you don't forgive others, then your heavenly Father will not forgive your transgressions. You're never more like God, I think some people have said, than when you're forgiving people. So why should our church, why should this church forgive? Let's look at a couple of those. We're going to wrap it up. One, verse 10, that they, like Paul, like us, live our lives under the close presence of Christ. You see that in verse 10? Because Jesus is watching. That Jesus is expecting. That Jesus is empowering us to obey. There's commands. Paul wrote that in verse 9. He put them to the test, he says in verse 9, to see if they would be obedient in all things. What are the all things? Church discipline and then forgiveness. Another reason we want to forgive, this one's pretty clear, is we want to be a church of, of, of love, a church of kindness, a church of healing. I think we all need a little healing, don't we? This isn't about the church of the iron fist church that wields, wields a club, this is the, the place that you come hopefully to get healed and get fixed in your relationship with Christ and built up and restored. That's what our church should be like. So Paul's going to say in 2 Corinthians chapter 7 that, the, you know, you guys were sorrowful, but the sorrow brought repentance. That's a good sorrow, but the problem we have here is there is no redemptive sorrow in this guy that's being drowning, is drowning in just misery, Paul calls in verse 7 excessive sorrow. What, what use is that, Paul says? He's already repented. Why do you want a guy sorrowful that's already repented? That makes no sense. What good can we get out of that? So it doesn't matter what the sin is, folks. We don't put levels on sin. We don't reject repentant sinners. It doesn't matter what degree of sin they were in. We don't kick people when they're down. That's not loving. We forgive. And we forgive again and again and again and again and again. So when I get this often. People will backslide. They'll pull out of the church for three weeks, four weeks, five weeks, and they'll come back and they're like, oh, pastor, you're probably so mad at me. I said, I'm disappointed with you. Yeah, of course I am. No, you're probably not happy to see me. No, I'm rejoicing that you're here. Nothing's making me happier right now than seeing you in this building. That's a good sign. No, you're going to be punished. You're going to have to sit in the back corner for the next three weeks. <laughs> little bad boy hat on your head. No, you're, you're, we're going to get you for that. Oh, we don't set arbitrary limits on who we give grace to and how much grace. No, everybody gets it. Everybody gets the mercy. They all get the love, right? That's what good churches do. And third reason, look at verse 11. We forgive and we discipline. So that, this is interesting, no advantage would be taken of us by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his schemes. Now, that's, this is interesting. He wraps up this section with that. He concludes this section with that particular warning. He brings Satan into this thing. You say, what does that mean? Let me explain this one to you. This is interesting. Do you know that we have a spiritual enemy that is seeking to, to shut this place down? Do you know that there is a spiritual enemy that is lording over all the people without Christ and holding them captive to his schemes and evil strategies. That the problem we have is not with people. The problem we have is that people are prisoners of war of the evil one. That right now as we speak, and I, I don't know how your theology of Satan goes, but in my theology, I don't think Satan is here right now. He's, he's not omnipresent. He can only be at one place at one time, I believe. Uh, if he is here right now, I take that as a tremendous compliment. I don't think that we are the biggest problem on his radar right now. Oh, good, he's not here. Oh, well, I don't, don't, he's got all of his demons. And I can promise you right now, there are demons all over the place right now in our midst. I believe that with all my heart. See, I can't see them. Well, you can't see them. They're invisible. They're here. They're here. And they want nothing more than to shut this church down. Why? 
Because they hate the church. Why do they hate the church? Because the the presence of Christ is no more readily seen and manifested than in the local church. Satan wants to shut this down. He wants to extinguish this church. And how's he going to do it? Well, he tried the immorality in 1 Corinthians. The guy's shacking up with his stepmother, right? Ah, That didn't work. All right. We tried false doctrine. We tried to mess with the resurrection in chapter 15. Ah, the church got that one right as well. Oh, Satan's greatest one, divisiveness. Selfishness. Right? I'll take the church down if I have to, as long as I get vindicated. I mean, I've seen people that think that way. They get hurt in the church, and they're they're, they're willing to see the whole church burn to the ground if it means vindicating their name. I've seen it. Satan's like, that's my boy, way to go. Well, that didn't work either. All right, we're running out of options. Well, Satan's always got one more trick up his sleeve. Ah, lack of forgiveness. Lack of forgiveness. When we refuse to forgive one another, this is what Paul's getting at here. A lack of forgiveness produces hatred. Satan's like, I like to work with hatred and strife and bitterness retaliation and grudges and hard hearts and Satan says that's fuel that I can use especially when they deal with sin in a harsh way I can use that as well we take the good stuff and when we go take the good stuff and go in bad direction Satan says that's what I can use that's the leverage I need to get a church split going here and that's why Paul says Just remember, it's not just you guys on this horizontal level. There is a spiritual level involved in this as well, vertically. That we do all things, as he says, in the presence of Christ. But don't forget, the presence of our adversary is also in our midst. And therefore, verse 11, don't be ignorant of his schemes. Remember that, Grace Tabernacle. He's subtle. He's cunning. He's very un. Uh, canny and sometimes the way he does his things but the one thing we can always count on regarding Satan is he's predictable don't be ignorant of the way he works know his schemes that's why we're called in scripture Ephesians 6.11 to stand firm against the schemes of the devil Ephesians 4.27 not to give the devil an opportunity so you got wisdom here Paul dealing with his church with a very wise perspective he knows that the, the, the unity of this church is more important than his own personal feelings. He knew when the time had come that we need to execute discipline on this individual. He knew the dangers that come when a church refuses to forgive another person. He knew that the church and their unforgiveness was now actually more disobedient than the guy that they disciplined who had now repented, right? So I guess my question for you is, have you, have you given your life to Christ? Are you on Satan's team or are you on God's team? There's only two teams in this cosmic struggle. Either you're John 8, a child of Satan, or you're a child of the living God. And the way to come to know this, this, this God who exists, who's also in our presence as well, with his mighty angels fighting for us right now as we speak, is through the Lord Jesus Christ, who through his great love for you went to the cross and gave his life that you might have fellowship with him. If you haven't given your life to Christ, you need to acknowledge that you, like me, like all of us, we're sinners. And that we've turned our back on God, we've rebelled against Him, we've sided with the enemy. And that God says, you can come back to me through Christ. And we embrace Jesus. And He washes away all of our sins. He forgives us completely. He adopts us into His family. It's just embracing Jesus. That I believe you died for my sin on the cross and I give you my life. And I live all of my days for you. You are my Lord and my Savior. That's what it means to be a Christian. That's what it means to be a child of God. And if you're a child of God, you have been baptized, you know that, into God's church. You've been baptized. You say, this church? No, not this church. You've been baptized into his church. You belong to the church of Jesus Christ. And if you belong to the church of Jesus Christ, you are commanded to belong to a local church as well. And it says in Scripture, not to forsake the assembly in the local church. And the local church is the best institution in the world. But my friends, the church is not heaven. The church is filled with redeemed individuals who love Christ, but the church is also filled with redeemed sinners. That means all of us who still sin, right? 
And that's why we need wisdom in our church. To always consider church unity more important than our personal grievances. It's all about the unity of the church. Because we have a good theology that this isn't just some, some, some institution that has no meaning. This is the bride of Christ. There is a purity about this place. This church is sanctified. This church is, clean. this church is the apple of God's eye. This church has been bought with the shed blood of Jesus. And how dare me get all bent out of shape in the way I was treated if it means damage to the Lord's church. Paul says, yeah, I was hurt a little bit, but really you guys should be the ones that agree the most because your church is burning to the ground. Do we have wisdom to patiently and lovingly confront sin? First in our own lives, removing the logs before we try to remove the speck in another person's eye, but are we willing to do that? Because we love each other? And can we forgive each other? Always and often. Just like Christ always and often keeps forgiving us, right? Father, we pray that you will bless us in these regards. We pray that we as a church will be the church that you are pleased with. That we would be unified and that we would be always considering other people more important than ourselves. And more important than people would always be Jesus and his reputation and the great love and the cost that it took for him to purchase this church. May we be people of love. And people of love care about people who are suffering. People of love care about people who are not having any accountability and are backsliding in their lives. People in love confront sin. And people in love also forgive each other when they get sinned against. The same way, Lord, you have forgiven us and that you keep forgiving us and keep forgiving us and keep forgiving us. Thank you for the blessed relationship we have with you. May we understand that and may it spill out from us in the way we treat other people in your church. Thank you for the church. It is so much of a blessing to be a part of this church with these particular people. May we keep persevering and may we stay strong until the day you call us home or to the day you return to take us back to yourself. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.